Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Institute for Australian and Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. My name is Jing Han. I'm the director of this institute. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are sitting on the Parramatta South Campus, which is the country of the Darug people of the Darug Nation, and to acknowledge that their ancestors who have been the traditional owners of the country for thousands of years. We would also like to pay our respect to First Nations elders, past, present, and emerging. Welcome to RAC Culture Talks, which is to build up cultural knowledge and understanding of multiculturality through sharing recent studies of specific areas that will engage inform and enlighten audiences so as to better relate to the world of diversity and understand humanities from a diverse range of cultural perspectives. The video of the inaugural lecture by Professor Wan Inswen of UTS is not now on our website and you can watch it anytime. It is purely a coincidence or maybe innately correlated that the lecture one topic is love troubles in China, now followed by today's topic, transnational divorce, understanding intimacies and inequalities from Singapore. We are delighted and privileged to have a Dr. Ke Yiling to give this talk. Dr. Ke is my colleague working at a Western Sydney University as a senior lecturer and a convener of a culture and society at the School of Humanities and Communication Arts. Dr. Kerr received her Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Social Science, Applied Sociology from National University of Singapore and a PhD in Sociology from University of Sydney. She has won a prestigious and highly competitive Australian Research Council linkage grant for her research project on place-based employment and enterprise of newly arrived young migrant women. As a very successful young academic, Eileen has already published two books and is working on her third book. And that book is about Asian migrant women and a fire dragon fan feminism. Yes, Dr. Ke Eileen is also a fire dragon feminist. She will touch on this in her talk. During Eileen's presentation, followed by my conversation with her, please post any questions you may have on the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Now we'll collect them at the end of the talk uh, for Eileen to respond. Now please welcome Dr. Ke Eileen to give her presentation. Thank you, Professor Han Xing. So as uh, Professor Han has uh, introduced me, um, I'm uh, Dr. Kwa Yiling, my pronoun is she, her, and uh, this evening I'll be talking about transnational divorce, understanding intimacies and inequalities from Singapore. I would like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, Dara Iwawara, Darawa, and Wiradjuri people. It is upon their ancestral land that Western Sydney University is built. I wish to acknowledge their sovereignty was never ceded and the land we are meeting today remains stolen and occupied. I wish to acknowledge my privilege, responsibilities and complicity as a migrant living and working and reaping benefits from a settler colonial system that continues to perpetuate injustices and inequalities against First Nation people. I would like to pay my respect to the elders, past, present and future, for they hold the memories, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. Um, this second book is, is written as a sequel to my first book um, on divorce biography. And so this second book, I extend the theoretical framework of divorce biography to conceptualize the transnational aspect of divorce experiences. So looking at a uh, global hierarchy of citizenship, looking at uh, transnational patriarchy, as well as migration. So extending divorce biography in a more global context. 
And based on the um, in-depth one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, they have conducted with 50 divorced uh, people, I um, found these four uh, prominent teams uh, in, in their narratives. Um, and I came up with a theoretical framework, which I call transnational divorce biography. Um, and uh, it's really important to note that the theoretical work of this project is also a ground up approach derived from empirical findings collected through in-depth interviews with uh, transnational divorced people. And these are the four teams that emerge from very dense narratives of these 50 research subjects of the study. And all their um, stories kind of display common themes around unequal effects of a global neoliberal economy and global hierarchy of nations. Uh, their stories also reveal shifting intersection of multiple systems of domination and oppression, as well as we witness this trans-border flow of intimacies and familiar resources, not just across geographical uh, borders, but also across um, normative, um, heteronormative families and non heteronormative families. And another prominent theme that emerged from the narrative is, is liminality, resistance, and hope. So I will touch on this few, these four themes as I go through um, uh, the four groups of diverse respondents that I so The book covers the ways in which unequal and uneven distribution of life transits and resources really shape the transnational diverse diverse trajectories, outcomes, and intimacies. Well, even though, though the book was set in Singapore, where I did most of my field work interviews, it is really a global story of transnational divorce because transnational divorce or transnational marriage is not unique to Singapore uh, with the high uh, uh, migration rates across the globe. We have witnessed uh, you know, also increase in transnational marriage and therefore increase in transnational divorce so transnational divorce really reveals global and regional hierarchy of countries and citizenship, transnational patriarchy, um, national border regimes, national immigration regimes, heteronormative structures of marriage and family, as well as the shifting intersection of privileges and inequalities. So for the rest of this uh, talk, I will explain how these four groups of divorce construct their transnational divorce intimacies under very different conditions. Um, so I did not set out to, in, to look for these four groups of people, but out of the 50 uh, subjects that I interviewed, um, I could loosely categorize them into these four groups. So we have the low-income divorced marriage migrant women, uh, low-income divorced citizen men, middle class living apart together divorced parents, and overseas-based divorced citizen members. So the first group of divorce respondents that I interviewed, to understand the transnational divorce biographies of low-income divorce marriage migrant women, we first need to understand the context of marriage migration. Now, what we have witnessed as a result of a global neoliberal economy is the dramatic expansion of low-wage feminized work. Again, like I just want to emphasize this is global, it is, it's not unique to Singapore. So you see the mobilization of a large number of migrant women from poor social economic background and less wealthy countries. They were moved to supply reproductive and domestic labor to men and families from wealthier countries. So this is a global trend, right? That we've been witnessing for the last decades. Now, when I say, when I talk about reproductive labor, I'm not just referring to uh, giving birth, you know, having children, but reproductive labor really refers to activities that help to achieve the reproduction of human beings and families, whether it's intra-generationally or intergenerationally. So anything that, consti that constitute the work of maintaining their household or their family is considered reproductive labor. Now, this reproductive labor can be paid or unpaid. Now, the paid ones are the, the labor that we're very familiar with, for example, domestic helpers. 
right, that they are being brought into families to uh, help to look after the domestic care, whether it is residential domestic helpers or those who come in in the day and then they go home, you know, or go back to their work quarters at the end of the day. You have healthcare workers like nurses, all those um, people who work in nursing homes, the healthcare workers who work in nursing homes, all of these are also paid uh, reproductive laborers so because they help to maintain the the reproduction of human beings intra and intergenerationally we also have cleaners we have nannies we have sex workers we have people who do our nails people who work in the hair salon all these are large number of of migrant women being mobilized from poor uh, social economic background and less wealthy countries to meet the the demands of of our lifestyle in wealthy countries. But what is often invisible is unpaid labor. And unpaid labor is performed by marriage migrants because of how we have romanticized the notion of marriage. We think that people should fall in love and, and you know, and, and that's how marriage come about. But they do not see that actually unpaid reproductive labor is often performed by marriage migrants in their roles as wives, mothers, and daughter-in-law. So they're being brought in large numbers to, to also meet the demand of families in wealthier countries. And they're brought in as unpaid labor, their work, the, the kind of um, contribution that they make to the economy of wealthy country is often unseen and invisible. And they go in as, as wife to provide sex labor, uh, as mothers to provide reproductive labor, to give birth to children, and as daughter-in-laws to provide elder care labor, and also to provide domestic care labor to look after the house and to clean up the house. So for many poor women from less wealthy countries, going on this route of marriage migration is not something that they aspire since young, that you know this is my childhood dream or this is my aspiration. It is because they do that because it's the only viable way that they know to lift themselves and their families out of poverty and to gain mobility, whether it's geographical mobility or social economic mobility. Now, based on the neoliberal logic behind this kind of very specific global marriage migration trend, poor women are brought in to supply reproductive labor. They are therefore expected to perform their labor, just like how we bring in construction workers or we bring in skilled migrants. We are expected to, they are expected to produce a certain kind of labor that their, their uh, whole society would want them to provide. Now, some of these marriage migrant women will find themselves with very little bargaining power because the minute they enter that kind of marriage, it's already contractual and it's transac transactional. So they have very little bargaining power and they're constantly being evaluated by their citizen husband and in-laws um, in the way they perform all this labor, whether it's domestic chores, whether it's sex, whether it is um, intimacy practices or caring for children. And therefore, they are constantly in a vulnerable position that they may face possible ejection or disposal by the family should they fail to fulfill their responsibilities or their side of the bargain. And when divorce takes place, this is when they are even uh, they are, they are thrust into a, a more vulnerable position as non-citizen, non-PR because they face the immediate possibility of being sent back to their home country and se be separated from their own uh, children. Because once they exit the marriage that legitimize their entry in the first place, they face another round of disposal by their host country when their citizen spouse decides to withdraw sponsorship of their visa. Now, this is, again, like I say, not unique to Singapore. Every country, every wealthy country uh, would have their own migration regime, their own border uh, control or population control policy, and they change all the time. So, um, so as a non-citizen spouse, you constantly wonder whether uh, you are able to stay on if you have not managed to secure a PR, and even if you manage to secure a PR, whether you can stay uh, to acquire your citizenship. So there's always this dark cloud over their head that whether, you know, am I doing enough to, to stay and, and, there's, and this imminent threat that if I don't be a good wife or don't be a good daughter-in-law, a good mother, maybe my family will just, you know, chuck me or dispose me and I have to leave. So to make sense of their experience, I use the framework of violence to understand their experiences. 
Now, I use in transnational intersectional feminist lens uh, to analyze these stories. And what it really means is that as a transnational feminist, what I'm concerned is, is how life chances are uh, distributed unevenly or unequally among different groups of people, uh, different countries. And that's the result of unequal and uneven effects of globalization. Um, and we know that certain uh, events and certain processes like economic globalization or immigration regime or national popul population control policies can all produce different outcomes for different people, depending on where you are located within a uh, uh, certain context um, and also depending on your interaction with, with uh, different environments. Now, when one thinks of violence, right, what typically comes to mind is physical violence, right? So we often think about sexual violence or sexual assault, uh, intimate partner violence, domestic violence, or war, or uh, genocide, or mass shooting, or hate crimes. We, we often don't think of violence in another way. And my work in, uh, to think about what happened to these women is to uh, bring to your attention another notion of violence, which is administrative violence. And administrative violence is very hard to call out, but they are nevertheless uh, very harmful to how bodies are being disposed, uh, being discarded when they're no longer needed, or they're being depleted, where they're being weakened bit by bit, where it didn't feel like there's any dignity in their lives. So in the context of migration and citizenship, so we know that some bodies or some lives or some people, if you belong to certain desired category, um, for example, you belong to the proper class, your upper class uh, or mid upper middle class, you belong to the proper gender, cisgender or sexuality that you're heterosexual or the right race, you're you are a white person, Anglo-Saxon person, or you belong to a country that is highly ranked in the global hierarchy of nations. If you belong to all these proper, correct uh, combination of, of categories, you know that you are on a very different trajectory. You're almost walking on the red carpet. On the other hand, other bodies that encounter intersection of all these multiple systems of oppression, uh, for example, um, you are, your country of origin is at the bottom of the global hierarchy of citizenship, uh, you face xenophobia, you face heteronormativity because you are not in a heterosexual relationship, or you are a woman and therefore you face patriarchy, or you are a queer person, you face homophobia, or that all makes you more vulnerable to ejection and disposal by the country that receives you as a migrant. So this disposability of ties and ejection of bodies is all part of a broader neoliberal regime uh, that we commonly observe across the globe, right? Not just in this case that I'm examining. And, and therefore, it brings to mind uh, what uh, Judith Butler has discussed in terms of hierarchy of value of human lives, because we know that some lives matter more. Like in the most recent uh, pandemic, we can see that, you know, some lives matter more. They have a great access to vaccination, to, to survival, whereas some, you know, they, they just dropping dead like flies and nobody even bat an eyelid. So this unequal distribution of life chances is really what I'm interested to look at. Um, and, and in this case, uh, Dean Spade, conceptualization of administrative violence is really helpful. Um, Dean Spade discusses administrative violence in the context of North American society, uh, being a settler colony where bodies are already being arranged into categories like country of origin, gender, race, sexuality, and ability. And all these administrative systems basically make up of policies, laws, um, um, uh, different kind of bureaucratic uh, procedures to define what it means to be a citizen. And the citizenship parameters always shift um, in different in, in countries, right? It depends on which political party is in control. And, and it creates, therefore, classes of population. And therefore, then distribute the resources according to these classes of population. So bodies, like I say, that don't fit into the proper categories are often at greater risk of encountering administrative violence. And in this case, in my research, the low-income divorced migrant women experience all this manifestation of administrative violence, whether it is at home with their family, with their husband, or 
in the broader society, like in the case of Singapore, where they face, you know, disposal or ejection after they have left their, their work site, right? The site that they're supposed to produce labor. So if you look at some of the stories in my book, right, um, many non-citizen divorced migrant mothers uh, encountered disposability of ties. Immediately, they were being disposed, discarded like, like waste. When their Singaporean husband decided that, oh, we no longer, we don't want to, we don't want your reproductive and domestic labor anymore. It's no longer required or desired. Because in the first place, they entered the international ma market marriage market to purchase something they see themselves as a consumer right and they and that is what happened when you see the intimate labor being commodified and these women are like commodities being brought over so they they think that they have the greater bargaining power to pick and drop now it is not to make a villain out of this husband but it is how the conditions set them up in that where the husband will go into the international marriage market where they can pick a, a um uh, a, a wife out of a catalog and then give an introduction fee or a broker fee and then bring them back. And then if you already set up a, a marketplace for marriage where um, one spouse is being portrayed or is being set up as a, a consumer, that, that understandably you want your, your purchase to have certain returns, right? So when it doesn't meet your requirement, a lot of women, uh, like in this case, uh, child were literally thrown out of the house like a rag doll after their citizen husband has lost interest, either that they feel that you didn't fulfill my needs, whether it's sexual needs, intimacy needs, or reproductive needs, you're not giving me a child, or you're not looking after my, grand my parents well, or that I'm just no longer interested in you since I know that I can go back to the market and pick another one. Right. So this in some women in my sample face disposal uh, when their former Singaporean spouse and their in-laws decided that they no longer want them. And 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 based on their neoliberal logic, um, you know, they deem that they feel that since I've really paid for this and they are not keeping to their deal of the patriarchal bargain, uh, it will be pointless or a waste of resources to keep her. But this marriage migrant women are not just only disposed by their family but also by Singaporean society when when because in the first place they were being co-opted into that work site like I mentioned into the institution of heteronormative marriage uh, it's hard to imagine that marriage can be the a work site but in this case it's the, it's the site of where they produce they, they supply the labor right and then once that site is gone they are being seen as somebody who has lost their reproductive or productive citizen potential um, and therefore, you know, they are being read as non-intelligible in, in, in the society. That why are you here when you're no longer producing that, that, that labor? So retaining them then doesn't make any economic sense. So based on the neoliberal logic again, that the that um, Singaporean society or any other whole society will think that to keep them will drain resources that are being reserved for citizens and they will add straight to the economy. So then they went another round of disposal and, and this can be taken place very easily by saying that, oh, uh, we don't approve your visa renewal or that we think that, oh, you're no longer eligible to apply for another renewal. So it, it appears to be very bureaucratic and very cold, but then this is how administrative violence works in, in the lives of these women. Now another group of um, P, another group of divorce respondents that I I interview are the men, right? So we also want to know how about this citizen man, this Singaporean citizen man who went into the international marriage market to find a a a, a foreign wife. You know what is their side of the story? So I interviewed this man. And a lot of these men feel, view themselves as the consumer. Uh, again, I want to emphasize it's not to make them the villain because it's really how the condition has put them in the position that they feel that they need to go to the market to find a wife, right? But then by doing that, already they're caught up in this commodification of intimacy chain. Um, they Why is it that they have to go to the international ma marriage market? Because they're not getting success in the low, low, local marriage market because of their low income status, uh, or that they could be that they are already uh, divorced a few times and they are in the senior age group. And, and so they want, they know that they want to get another wife. And the reason why they want to get another wife is because of this masculinity project that they engage in. 
So while they feel that they, they lack the marriageable qualities in the local market scene, they know that they will be sought after as highly eligible husband in less wealthy countries. So they, because of the regional hierarchy, bear in mind this is Singapore. So Singapore is, is considered one, the, probably the most affluent country in the region. And therefore, the, it's the magnet of marriage migration. Right, people want to migrate to Singapore so that they think that they, they have a higher chance to, to become citizen and therefore have, have, have greater access to resources, to wealth, and enjoy that mobility. So this poor citizen man, even though they could be working class or very poor in Singapore, once they enter the international marriage market, their social status increase. So it boosts their masculinity project because it makes them feel that, hey, you know, I'm 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 worthy of something. I'm not as uh, a failure as, as Singapore society has made it, me out of. So we, we must also be mindful of this regional hierarchy of countries, not just the global hierarchy of countries. So it's not just Singapore, but South Korea, Japan, they're all like desired destination of, for marriage migration, uh, uh, for marriage migrant women um, from less wealthy countries in Asia. So these Singaporean men, most of them are Singaporean Chinese men because they know they're privileged by their highly ranked Singaporean citizenship, their Chinese ethnicity, uh, because in Singapore, um, Chinese is the ethnic majority and therefore you enjoy that kind of uh, ethnic majority privileges. Also being a man and being heterosexual, you, you are, so the combination of all these privileges make them in demand in the regional marriage market. They are not in demand in the local marriage market, but they're in demand in the regional marriage market. So that really makes them feel that they are they their successful masculinity project is in motion. Now, to understand about masculinity project, I think we need to take one step back to, to really understand what it means to be a successful Singaporean man. Now, the picture of successful masculinity in Singapore context is, is inspired by um. Singaporean post-colonial masculinity that not only embody the British colonial masculine ideas that we have inherited as a post-British colony, but at the same time also that we have um we also have taken on uh, a, a post-colonial transformation that the, the political party, the Singapore political party, has constructed for us to aspire. Right. So what it means is that it is constructed to uh, where the, the, the Chinese dominant party, political party, has constructed this Confucian masculinity project for us to aspire to. That, that, that is a combination of philosophical values derived from Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Christianity. So it developed a very particular brand of hegemonic masculinity. So what it means to be a successful uh, man in Singapore is this image of a Singaporean Chinese man who occupies a powerful, respectable, high-paying political and government job and work hard for his citizens. And, and in the private sphere, he's the head of the household. He's the heterosexual, legally married uh, patriarch that look after the family. He's a very reliable economic provider. He's a faithful husband to his wife. And he's a devoted father to his children. And very importantly, a filial son to his elderly parents. Now, this is not just a set of uh, philosophical values, but it is also a set of very important values that anchor the, all the citizens together uh, where it will then ensure that each family sustain itself without relying on the state for, for welfare. So if you are a filial child, you are supposed to look after your elderly parents. You shouldn't be looking to the government to support your elderly parents, right? You should be looking after your parent, your, your own uh, children and your own uh, your own uh, spouse. You should keep it together. You shouldn't have any divorced families because divorced family means that the you are being irresponsible. You are creating burdens to the state. So all this is all part of how uh, you know how the 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 state has constructed a set of philosophy to get the citizens to to decide to get the citizen to as, aspire this kind of ideas to be a good citizen. So this is how the citizenship parameters have been constructed. And, and so often when, when uh, citizens talk about how oh, we should be traditional, it's, it's highly traditional, but it's, if we look at it carefully, it's socially constructed to make you feel like you need to cling on to the traditional values in order to be a good citizen. But, but, but these are highly constructed in a very unique post-colonial society to get citizens to work very hard and to aspire a certain kind of values that the state wants. 
Now, for, for the low-income citizen men, they are caught up in it. So whether they are, uh, you know, they didn't get managed to get any wife in the local market or that they have been divorced many times and they are old, they feel that they're still caught up and trapped in this kind of ideas that I need to have my um, dignity. I need to have my zun yan, that I must be able to hold my head high to be this successful man. And therefore, even though I have to go to the international marriage market, I will do it just to get a wife and just to uh, allow me to, to work on this masculinity project. So, so this is why I, I, I um, conceptualize as instrumental intimacies that this uh, kind of transnational marriage is, is instrumental to how they it contribute to their masculinity project. Now, what happened when it didn't succeed, when it fails, when their, their investment into this masculinity project didn't give them the payoff that they want? Then they feel this, they felt this great sense of fit masculinity, which is so um evident in my uh respondents' narratives because they feel that they have been um they feel that they have been let down. They feel that they've been shortchanged. They feel that it's very, uh, uh it's, it's, they feel very stupid. They feel, you know, loss of face, very duly, and, and that they feel like they have a fa they are failure. So most of the men I spoke to described that, you know, that they, they and, and, and because of that, they're so angry. A lot of them cancel their, the sponsorship of their foreign wife immediately, or they, they use their citizenship privileges to get the custody of the children. And then this allowed their, foreign wife to have any access to their children. Um, and, and then all that they feel that I have more power, I can choose if I don't like you anymore. I, I you know, I, I don't think that you can fulfill me sexually. I find somebody else. And they just chuck them. So they have a lot of bargaining power and they can dare re-enter the marriage market and they know that they will still be highly sought after. They know that they will still be in demand because of their citizenship privilege. And so the global citizenship of nations or citizenship is really what we need to pay attention to. So if you look at this particular case of Tech An Rai, so what he did was that he thought that he would, uh, you know, want to uh, discover his own masculine power and his own masculine, masculine, uh, masculinity project by by uh, going into the market and, and marry his Thai wife. But because his Thai wife started to um, check on him, started to you know, text him a lot and want, wanted to know where, where he was, that he felt that his own uh, position of power was undermined. And, and that's when the Confucian masculinity is at work because you know, Confucianism always emphasizes your place in the hierarchy and respecting the authority of those that are higher up. So Tech An's wife has has clearly not known her place. And so Teng An was very, very angry and uh, felt that he couldn't exert his patriarchal control and then bought a, a one-way ticket and sent his Thai wife back and cut off contact between his wife and his two sons. But it wasn't a straightforward, like say not straightforward villain versus victim narrative because later he felt guilty and then started to made regular contact with his wife, ex-wife, and even arranged for his children to go and visit his his uh, ex uh, his their mother and pay for all the trips. And and surprisingly, even decided to transmit monthly uh, uh, allowance to his ex-wife and his family. And he was very clear to want to remind me before we parted that it was because that he sent his ex-wife and her family money that he could not build a house, enjoy electricity and have food. If not, they're so curlian, you know, so poor thing that are you, how, how, how can they live like that as a Singaporean man? We, if we can help, we should help, right? You know, so it's from that kind of a position that, and, and why is it that? Well, I suggest or I argue that why is it that he resumed that remittance project or resumed that, that masculine project? Because he felt that he could then, you know, um, restore his sense of masculine pride again, his Nansing Zunian, and feel good about himself, even though he's been divorced. He, he can feel that as a Singaporean man, he's still helping, you know, the poor in the region. So these are the two groups of low-income uh, divorce respondents that I spoke with that were, that were very revealing of, you know, that really reveals that global hierarchy of nations that also show the intersectional um, uh, systems of oppression and, and, um, and, and also show the trans-border flow of resources, right? The other two groups are more uh, middle class. And I think it's important to always also talk about privileges, not just to talk about oppression. Um, if we use an intersectional feminist lens, I'm not sure how I'm doing with time. 
I'm okay. Okay, I keep going. <laughs> so with this group, right, they are the middle class. And and you, you it's interesting you look at their stories as well because they are then able to construct their privileged intimacies, uh, where where they have um, they they encounter multiple forms of privileges and they manage to negate the the undesirable implication of that's associated to the transnational divorce. They manage to restore their lives quite quickly, um, and because of the combination of privileges that derive from the citizenship, their location of residence, their class, their uh, education background, their ethnicity and sexuality, they could tap on all these supportive resources and even engage um, really well known. Uh, legal firms that specialize international transnational divorce because you need to know the legal systems you know in different countries and it works very differently and work out uh, all kinds of uh, post-divorce transnational intimacies that work for both sides and in some cases their ex-spouse are in another country so you really need to know what's what are the things that you can do and what are the things you cannot do because uh, different countries are different uh, signatories of the the Hague Convention of um, Protection of Child Rights. And not all countries are signatory. So you, you need to know all these uh, legislative uh, systems to ensure that you don't get into trouble. And if you have the resources, you can work it out, right? But in, in the earlier cases where if you don't have the resources and you're being sent home uh, and you're being cut off all ties, you just can't come back. You just can't see your children anymore. But in this case, this middle class uh, living apart together, divorced parents work it out really, really well. Um, and, and, and they are able to still stay together in the sense that uh, uh, because of, of the, for the sake of the children and they continue to work out very innovative um, intimacy practices. One, uh, one significant case is uh, where you can make use of virtual communication technologies. So if you live in an uh, affluent country, uh, 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 a wealthy country where you have you know, where, where Wi-Fi is just taken for granted and you have the economic resources because of your privileges, you can then innovate uh, transnational intimacy practices online, right? For example, uh, this, this particular case like Miranda, um, Miranda, what Miranda did was that um, um, her ex-husband was based in the US, so they had a, a weekend visit, and the weekend visit is a virtual visit. So instead of, you know, bring your children to your ex-spouse and let them you know interact on a weekend uh they uh she would allow the kids to go online to this virtual um gaming platform and play games the whole day we know these things are not expensive but of course if you are uh in the middle class uh bracket you can afford this and then she could have the whole day to herself going to the spa and go to the gym and have a day off right and her children will be there 12 hours literally like a weekend visit 12 hours with her ex-husband, they will play games and interact the whole day. So this is these are some of the innovative um, middle class living apart together privileged uh, intimacies that we I managed to observe in my sample. But we need to note that migration scholars have often argued that access to digital technologies really depend on your class positions and geographical locations. Um, of of um, of uh, migrants, right, and therefore affect their abilities to have to keep in touch via um, virtual communication. Like I say, some of these low income respondents um, that I know who have gone back to their own countries, they have no economic resources to afford personal computers or, or smartphone or phone packages, a data plan. Um, so therefore, can't even FaceTime or Zoom with their children who don't live in the same country as them. Now the fourth group um, are the are the divorce um, the transnational divorce respondents who are stuck overseas. So they are not in Singapore. They are Singapore citizens, but they are stuck overseas. So they construct very they construct entangled intimacies with um, their families back in their home country in Singapore, and also um, you know really a very entangled intimacy with their ex spouse. Now I borrow uh, Gloria and Zandua, a Chicana feminist. Um, conceptualization of qualiquer state. Now, qualiquer is this, this uh, Mexican, uh, Aztec Mexican goddess here you've seen on the slide. Now, what, what this uh, goddess symbolizes is life in death, death in life. So you're, it's never so blank white, it's not clear, right? So Anzondua refer to this life in death and death in life state uh, of existence as, as often people who live in the borderland. 
like you're neither living nor you are dead. You are allowed to you you are you are, you you are you are living, but you are also you are also experiencing death in different ways, right? So it's is um what the, some Chinese will be familiar with, chosen food and choose Buddha. It's like you 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 want to die, you can't die. If you want to live, you cannot live, and and you're just in this kind of existence that doesn't really quite make sense. You're neither here nor there. So I use that kind of um, theor theorization or conceptualization to describe some of my respondents who are stuck overseas and continue to have this entanglement with their home country, with their ex spouse, with the children and with their parents, and they're stuck. They're suspended, right? There's they're caught in this kind of a purgatory state where they are like you know in liminality um and and what and for a variety of reasons they are stuck there um and their stories are all quite different uh but what it really means that they remain these entanglements remain there and they have to force to continue to construct these entangled intimacies whether they like it or not because it, it is still there and and they're not linear and not straightforward uh, for example, this case, Anaya, a Singaporean Indian divorced mother of three, she lived in the U.S. when I interviewed her for the project. She wasn't doing well in the U.S. It's not like she migrated to the U.S. and then lead uh, like, uh, the American dream. Uh, in fact, not. Uh, she she knows that uh, her children are all in Singapore. She's the only one there and she has a lot of unfinished business with a home plan. But she couldn't go back because as a Indian, as a Singaporean Indian uh, divorced mother, she faced a lot of stigmatization from her cultural groups and there's a lot of issues as well. she faced so much opposition when she wanted to get a divorce all kinds of um, uh, violence that took place at home so she had to leave to seek healing as and she lived in in the caravan park and you know and she practiced her own uh, spiritual healing work uh, her children are all back in in singapore so she knew that she has a lot of unfinished business and in her 50s now she lived a very highly precarious unstable existence with long-term homelessness and poverty uh, and, and she could have just gone back to Singapore to enjoy, take advantage of her citizenship rights and benefits and therefore gain also gain access to uh, her, her, her family, her adult children now who could support her. But she was very adamant about not returning and she therefore paid a very high price. So she chose this less trodden past to define her own happiness. But at the same time, she also knew that she, she has paid a high price. So there's this not fully there. She was in the U.S. hoping that her children would visit her um, and that continued to linger at the back of her mind. So she's not fully there to receive healing in the U.S. But she's not also fully in Singapore being with her children. So that is the kind of uh, liminality that that, um, that seems to be uh, prominent in this whole group of overseas-based citizen uh, divorced mothers who are struggling with homesickness but yet can't quite go home. So the whole book is really just an assemblage of all these human stories that relate to movements, shifts, connections, hardships, but more importantly, that their everyday lives and the variety of their, their um, struggles and precariousness or even possibilities reflect that intersection of global, transnational, national, local systems of domination and oppression. And they work it out depending on their conditions and working out uh, depending on their their encounters with privileges and inequalities. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eileen. That's just so really, really interesting. And so much to unpack, really. I mean, you know, obviously we've done the research for a long time. Um, I, I'm really fascinated. I have so many questions. I will ask the questions and uh, the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to post it onto the Q&A. So um, I have some, uh, uh, you know, like a, uh, a pers personal questions, like uh, firstly, what, what inspired your interest in doing research in this uh, transnational divorce? Well, um, I started on divorce. <laughs> so I started, um, um, my PhD project was on divorce. So divorce um, in Australia and Singapore. So that was my PhD research. Um, so I did a uh, few work research in both countries and uh, look at some of the differences in the policy context. Um, and at that time, my motivation was to present a document uh, to the Singapore government to get them to change their policies and their practices concerning divorced families. 
back then 10 years ago um it was still a very conservative approach to to towards divorce and um um so there's a bit of a uh, silent treatment where uh if we don't talk about divorce we don't need to to support them we don't need to uh finance them we don't need to look after them um so i wanted to use my phd project to provide to produce a very serious document to go back to singapore to present it to the policymakers that hey you need to look at this is the impact um, so that was very successful and, and about 200 policymakers came for the presentation and they bought the books and they started reviewing. Um, and then they approached me to ask, uh, to uh, say that, okay, we have this grant, do you want to apply? And uh, we are very interested in transnational divorce because in Singapore, there are many migrants. Uh, so there are, the marriage migration, international uh, marriage has rates have also gone up and they are curious about, you know, if, if there's any social impact or social implication of transnational divorce. So they invited me to apply for the grant and I got the grant. And so I started working on transnational divorce. I was also really interested to change my, um, my theoretical uh, direction from looking at intimacies, families, marriages to something wider, broader, to look at migration, look at uh, geopolitics, globalization, yeah, so that was quite a good move in my um, learning. Were you surprised uh, by the results or by your funding findings? Like when you're getting to obviously not have a full knowledge about, were the results surprised you? Um. Uh, I think yes and no. Um. I I think I really didn't have a sense of how um irritating some of this uh, man can be <laughs> but I think when I hear it first time I was like oh my god like and they seriously believe in it and so I was like oh god I try not to be judgmental because you know as a researcher you shouldn't be you should be detached from your subjects but also um, at the same time I can understand their entrapment because it's not something that they choose also it's really how patriarchy masculinity are being constructed so so um, logically and 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 uh, theoretically, I can detach myself and and you know and see them as um, as I mean the product of the kind of uh, socialization or the product of the kind of society. But when I'm there on the field, it can also be very uh, shocking by the kind of the kind of words they use and the kind of um, um, uh, description that they 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 use as well in the interview. So certain parts can still shock you. Um, and that you still need time to recover emotionally, uh, mentally after the interview. Uh, so, so some of these are quite, some of the, the really going to the ground and talking to this low-income citizen man, that part can be quite shocking. Uh, even though you kind of guess it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be shocking, but yet it's still uh, a shock to the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that is, that's the part that I think that left the deepest impression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you put like four categories of a people that uh, you have interviewed mm -hmm. and it's quite interesting, uh, each mm -hmm. with a very unique and difficult, tricky circumstances, each of them, uh, including the one that I found quite interesting is uh, you call it innovative. You know, it's mm -hmm. a very innovative intimacy. Mm -hmm. Intimacy is actually to us laymen, non your uh, discipline is like interact interactions mm. in, in many ways. So they have this innovative post-divorce co-parenting practice, mm. like involving set up a weekly virtual visit by video game play day. I found it as a fascinating. Again, that's something that uh, normally didn't occur to people who are not in that situation. And mm. you mentioned that in your research, you uh, interviewed 50 divorcees. How did you select your cases and in order to cover a wide range? And also, where did you find them? Uh, it's so difficult to find them. <laughs> to find divorced people are really very difficult. When I first came to Australia, it was very difficult to find. When I was in Singapore, it was very hard to find. And now I have to find transnational divorced people. That was even harder. Um, I didn't, the, the only criteria that I, I, I set out is that one, uh, it has to be somebody who has, married a Singapore spouse and divorce, right? So they have to be in a, in a marriage that has a Singapore citizen 
uh, and a non-Singapore citizen. So at the point of marriage, so after that, they could have gotten a PR or a citizenship, doesn't matter. At the point of marriage, it has to be international. So that was my criteria. Um, so I don't have an idea that they could be this um, middle class uh, couple that set up these innovative intimacies or that they are uh, people who are stuck overseas that cannot come back because they, they for a variety of reasons, some can't come back because they want to be near their children. You know, they have married, uh, say for example, Australian husband, Australian man, and they know that if they leave, they will have access because the Australian husband would not allow her to bring the children back. And both Australia and Singapore are signatories of hate convention of child rights, protection of child rights. So it's this kind of things. So I didn't know who I would get uh, and, and, and how I will, how, how, what it would happen. But I, that was my only criteria that I wanted to know, um, you know, that as long as they belong into this group, give me your stories. And, and so I interviewed 50 and that's how, you know, I'm, I look at the 58. Ah, yeah, there's these four groups that I can put them and it's quite clear, uh, quite distinct. Uh, which is not surprising. Also, you have you know the different class positions and the the and it's in line with the the marriage trend that you have um a low income citizen husband from a wealthy country would typically marry a a low income a woman from a less wealthy country. So that's the 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 significant marriage trend even in Australia or in uh you know different parts of Europe and and America, Canada, and so on. So that is quite clear. But then I was also interested to know what happened to um, the, the middle class uh, uh, Singapore women who have married uh, maybe a, a Caucasian husband or who have, or, or even non Caucasian, what happened to them? You know, how do they work it out? Yeah, so so that's how then I categorized. It was not difficult, not easy to find. I went through different ways. I went to um, uh, uh, migration uh, centers. I went to, um, I, I blasted out through my uh, network. At one point, my partner and I, we even uh, put in pamphlets uh, in all the letter boxes, uh, hoping to get some reply. Uh, and, and I think the, the, the main uh, attraction is also giving them a token of appreciation. So people who from the low income, say the low income marriage migrant women or the low income citizen spouse husband, they want the the, the give vouchers because times are hard, right? So if you put that as something to, as an incentive, they will want to give you that time. And also it's not good to make them talk to you for free. So I will also want to give them something in return. Mm. Yeah. So it's really interesting kind of you got your 50 divorcees or people who talk to you and it's sort of kind of a by chance that they fall into these four categories. But that, as you mentioned, that's just for like a randomness, but also actually deeply reflective. Yeah. Certain yeah. like a human order, as you mentioned, yeah. that you know, higher ranking uh, women yeah. tend not to marry lower ranking men yeah. in that case. Yeah. So, yeah. would you say that this would be more specific uh, Singaporean uh, situation, like in in this international marriage market? women especially foreign women who enter mm -hmm. into this international uh, marriage market in singapore they mm -hmm. are already disadvantaged because they mm -hmm. don't have a citizenship they're lower income and then they are very likely to be controlled because they have less bargaining chip uh, power yeah. Yeah, it has to do with transnational patriarchy. So it's not that uh, there's no cases where you have Singaporean women who marry uh, a low-income man from a less wealthy country. You, we do have that. Even in Australia, you can see that as well. But but the what we have, in the statistics show that majority of such uh, marriages made up of um, a low-income uh, citizen uh, man from a wealthy country and a low income married uh, women from a less wealthy country that that is the the general trend but of course there are other configuration uh, like i mentioned you know that that you can be a a, a middle class or wealthy singaporean woman marry uh, someone from a less wealthy uh, country it, it can happen as well um so so the four groups are really a reflection of the broader marriage migration trends uh, that is quite um observable across the globe mm -hmm. yeah i feel like i read in your book more um unfortunate 
women. I mean, women who are divorcees, mm -hmm. and they, most of cases, so they, they were uh, like in a very dire circumstances, mm -hmm. and often actually quite heartbreaking in mm -hmm. many. Mm -hmm. um, situation because it, as a foreign women they tend to be kicked out and then not only they left their home home that they built but would also have to left their children mm -hmm. so, yeah i think that is the story of uh, the expansion of global neoliberal economy it is really a story when we see the expansion on global neoliberal liberal economy we also see the 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 expansion of this mobilization of of low income women from less wealthy countries. Um, so you see a lot of stories um, like nurses or nannies or domestic helpers uh, from the U.S. Mexico borders or within Europe or the uh, or or even in the Middle Eastern countries. You know the, the all these are modern day slavery, right? And 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 that is the 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 the, the story across uh, the globe when we talk about marriage migrant women. So the idea of how we think that, um, you know, now with capitalism or with neoliberalism, we have an increase in, in um, 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 capital as well as uh, improvement of, of um, living standard. And we think that, oh, now women, there's, there's, there's also increase in workforce participation. We therefore think that women are more empowered. Um, I, 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 I really, really detest that that narrative <laughs> because women are not more empowered by just sheer statistics, right? That women, just because we see that there are more women in workforce, mm -hmm. they are therefore supposed to be more empowered. They are therefore, you know, oh, it's so much better than our, our parents and grandparents' generation. But it's not true. They are even living in more exploitative working condition. They are more in the workforce, but what kind of conditions are they in? They are going in as, as low wage um, you know, uh, laborers as, as domestic helpers, as sex workers, as people who do our nails, as people who work in the hair salon, um, to nannies and cleaners, and, and also people who, who are, are more impoverished than before. So they're stuck in that kind of modern day slavery. So we actually see a lot more women caught up in that. And, and the, the scary part is the marriage migration where it is invisible. You, it's hard to track because they are they get lost in each of this household, each of this marriage. And because marriage has been romanticized to think that it's supposed to be a place of refuge and happiness and whatever, right? Bullshit. But it is not. It can be a site of violence where you have nowhere to run. And, and especially if you are a foreigner, you, you go nowhere. And that is how the transnational patriarchy works. And it's all caught up in that global intimacy chain. Yeah, absolutely. It's a you know some of the cases are so dark, are so devastating. It's really beyond appalling. Uh, does it does this relate to my last question before I get to the audience? Mm -hmm. Relate to your um, own you know you at the end of the book you launched your own brand of a feminism called Fire Dragon Feminism. So is that the relation? between what you found and also launching your own brand. And what is Fire Dragon Feminism and how do we apply it? Thank you for asking that question. At the end, because I have been working on these kind of sad stories for 10 over years and I feel that, okay, how do I proceed as a, as a feminist, as an activist, as a teacher, as a researcher, and as a person? How do I carry on this work? What is my methodology? And what is the... the the motto or the manifesto that I can hold on to as I carry on doing this work of exposing all these injustices and inequalities. And I didn't also want to end the book with such a low note of like, oh, everything is so horrible. I wanted to also, you know, give myself something that I hope that I can, you know, go on. And so I launched Fire Dragon Feminism because I wanted to have a set of, like a toolkit. How do I deal with this, you know, and how do people deal with this? So I think it is, Fire Dragon Feminism is really a, a kind of ethics, a new, a new feminist ethics to reflect, um, Asian migrant women positionality, right? So as an Asian migrant woman, I, I, I'm caught up in Asian capitalism, the, the, the boom of, you know, the tiger economies in, in Asia. Uh, I reap so much benefits and I'm completely complicit in all these systems. But then how do I carry on, you know, my work as, as, a, as a feminist? How do I um, 
uh, check my complicity and privilege, but at the same time, how do I position myself to speak to all these injustices? And that's how Fire Dragon Feminism is 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 uh was given was birthed in that book. It was the launch. It was just a, a baby. I'm now working on it to develop the full framework in my in my next book as the next step of uh, that. Um, and and to look at the kind of um, intergenerational feminism work that has been happening in Asia. Um, so so it's it's a decolonial uh, project because I don't want to just always draw from uh, the global north, right? I mean, in the north we have amazing black feminism work, amazing Asian American feminism work, Chicana femi feminism work in the, in, in the Latin American. Uh, they are all great, and they are my teachers. But then being here. What does it mean? And, and thinking about my grandmother, my mothers, and thinking about the women in this part of the world, how do we come up with uh, a, fem a form of feminist ethics that makes sense to us, that help us speak to our context? And that's how, that's what I'm constantly, I'm, I'm currently working on. It's uh, fascinating. I mean, it's great. I can't wait to, to read your third book, you know, so, and you are very passionate, so intelligent and so thoughtful in your way of approaching this world, in understanding this world. We have to go to the audience for one question. Pan Wang asked a very good question. Uh, said, fascinating talk, Dr. Ke. I agree, it's a fascinating talks. I wonder how's the transnational divorce like among high income couples in Singapore? Do similar unequal gendered dynamics apply to this cohort or is it completely different? from the low income, low income couple. Yeah, so um um so I mentioned just now about the low in uh, the okay the, the low income couples uh, is quite distinct. Uh with the high income couples um uh what what we see is very gendered. So we have a uh, um more um uh, Singaporean women who marry up right like it's it's hypergamy so they marry the Caucasian men. Uh, so they marry like uh, people from you know the um, from US, UK, Europe, and and that's that's quite a a, a clear trend. Uh, so that's why some of these mothers are stuck in these countries like Australia and and New Zealand or different parts of Europe. Um, so the 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 gender dynamics or the gender uh, patterns are quite distinct. Where you the middle class or the uh, the the high income couples that I observe in terms of transnational divorce, typically, not all, but typically made are made of Singaporean women with uh, uh, Caucasian men. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, time has passed and we have to stop here now. And uh, Eileen, it is really, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure... I just highly recommend your book. It is so Thank readable. You. And many people being like sort of um, uh, deterred by academic books, but not Ealing's book. It is really fascinating to read and very interesting to read and very engaging. You do get a lot of fascinating insights, you know, as that's why I ask you, were you surprised? I mean, I was not so, so much a surprise, but it's really eye-opening, opening up to the world that you see in depth. I mean, you know, like we sort of know transnational divorce, but not in such a depth. And in this in depth, it's just insights into humanities. Thank you oh. again, Eileen. Thank you. And, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, thank you, audience. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next time when we have um, IEC Culture Talk uh, 3. We will have a Dr. Ming Lu Cheng from University of Sydney. And she will talk about female leadership in provincial China. She's a Thank very you. good friend. It is. Yes. <laughs> All related. Yeah. Thank Great. you so much. And uh, good evening, everyone. Bye, Eileen. Bye.